Climate engineering brings the Earth into the orbit of human making. But as Bronislaw Szczerski and Maya Galarraga suggest, making is not always what one associates with proposals to inject aerosols into the atmosphere or to fertilize the oceans. These are techniques of climate engineering that fall into two categories, as you know, solar radiation management and carbon dioxide removal. We are here to engage with these topics, but more importantly, we are here to explode the debate, to provoke what it is uh, climate engineering is and can be. Uh, this is because the advent of the Anthropocene and climate engineering uh, debates really urge us to ask deeper questions about our relationship to the climate system, to the Earth system, and to the sun. And to paraphrase Braun once again, if uh, hunter-gatherer societies monopolize land area to get their energy, and um, industrial societies uh, harness fossil fuels, decoupling their energy uses from territory, what kind of metabolic regime might come next? We are here today to present to you a future or futures in which civilization is truly solar powered. This is a vision that Tomas and his team have worked on for some time and it is called the Cloud City. You'll see behind me a visual of what we have been speculating a Cloud City might look like, but I would like to uh, emphasize that today we are not proposing to you a technology to fix climate change. We're asking you to speculate with us on a different way that we can relate to the world, to the air, and to the sun. Uh, so I'm going to turn it over to Tomas to talk to you about how he came to dream of cloud cities. Yes. Okay, thank you. And um, yeah, I'm happy to be here. Um, um, yes, it might take a little bit of time to warm up. But also the, the other thing is like uh, I'm, yeah, I'm happy that uh, we were here with Sasha and the invitation of follow with Brown and then I meet again Steve. And then, um, um, yes, a little bit in general. I mean, we will go a little bit through, uh, yes, some images. I hope so the images can talk a little bit by themselves, but we will try, nevertheless, I try to accompany with some thoughts and ideas. Um, this was, uh, well, I, 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 there are many people uh, or friends who we have been working together to produce these images, which some of them are here, and I'm very happy also about this. Uh, but a little bit to, to come back, and I know that we have uh, 15 minutes, and I will need to keep the time uh, close, because there are many images. But one of the things, uh, when I was back in Argentina, I somehow decided to study architecture. And, and somehow, at the same time, my grandfather presented me a book, which uh, was Architecture Without Architect. I was thinking today, what would I be, is to do geoengineering or climate engineering without engineers somehow, but somehow this is how I start to study architecture. And somehow when you study, it's kind of basically an essay of Bernard Rorke, which was in the exhibition at the MoMA. And when you open the book, uh, all these pictures which were down in the book, uh, they look like a city which look like very different of what cities looks like today. For example, this is in China and this is in Pakistan, because these are very warm uh, places. Some of them, they decided that all the city will be somehow underground. And the other one in Pakistan also, as you can see, the landscape of all the houses, they have this kind of, uh, uh, well, they said now they replace it with, uh, with uh, dishes of communication. But otherwise, the, the wind, it kind of blow there, and somehow, normally, uh, it might cool down uh, the building. This, I mean, this is how we somehow I enter into this idea of, uh, of uh, kind of uh, thinking that cities, and also, you know, I was living then uh, in exile, and my family was, under a, you know, it was a dictatorship period in Argentina, and then we were in exile in Italy for 11 years, and then we were close to Venice, and Venice also is built somehow in the water. This I mean, there was all the time this idea that the city somehow could look different. And a little bit then, you know, is again, you know, when you look at this picture, somehow they, uh, you know, you kind of uh, seem that the continental plates or the continents, uh, it became fluid as was, uh, in the time, um, many, many millions of years ago. Somehow there, you know, it started to kind of drive the imagination of thinking, okay, what about if cities, it might look like clouds, and somehow also it get a little bit more uh, fluidy uh, dynamics, and somehow uh, the first thing that we been thinking is saying, okay, why, uh, you know, to use the classification of, of clouds and then add the term city. This means you can say, okay, we could have an altrostratus city, a stratocumulus city, a cumulonimbus city, and from there, not just thinking like, well, you start that there is a Roman style, there is a Gothic, there is a Renaissance style, well, maybe there is a new type of, uh, 
of city which might be coming into the future. And a little bit how to think how these uh, cities will aggregate and form and, and construct each other, but basically it's uh, something very simple, it's just kind of uh, uh, spheres, we call it, or, uh, that they can come together. This, I mean, this was an installation in Villa Manin in Italy, and we were trying to aggregate these differ different spheres in, in different uh, forms, and then you can start to speculate a little bit more what will happen if, uh, if really get a, a kind of a, a bigger dimension and also the relationship with the sun. You know, many people used to say, well, here in Germany also, since I'm living for a long time, you know, you sometimes escape the very long winter and then you go very far away, but sometimes you can just go a few kilometers above the, the clouds and suddenly you could have a sunny day without flying so far away uh, to Palma de Mallorca or to some warmer city. Does it mean, you know, we start to, to speculate on how all these currents, it might kind of uh, shape and then get you close somehow to the atmosphere. One of the experiments we are doing at MIT with Il Ilaria, we want to run out, is that they, they, she said, when I was there, she said she find out kind of a neutral buoyancy particle in this uh, tank experiment, and then we are trying to figure it out if really by all these particles and not having one, but many of them it might, at the end of the day, uh, reassemble of a uh, future city or what shape it might come together. This means now I go through to some samples and say, okay, this might be an ultra-stratus city, and then, you know, how people might be in between flying in the net. This is something which is in Dusseldorf. We kind of go back and forth of trying to rehearse of how this uh, future city might look. This is something of 250 meter diameter. What is important always, we are thinking that they should fly only with solar energy. This means there is nothing else which uh, would be able to keep them up into the air. Now, when we talk about solar energy, we will go then later unrolling how is the, the, the technology. But the technology a little bit is what is, is not so much about, um, uh, it's very, very simple. There is no solar panel, there is no battery, there is no helium, there is no hydrogen, there is nothing of that. It's just like a a difference of temperature between inside and outside. This means is another sample. This, yeah, we were trying to close the gaps in between. This was in Netherlands. This was in Copenhagen and Hamburg and Banhof, some of the images inside, how people might inhabit. And then some of the ideas also of how uh, the different spheres can have different uh, activities. This means some of them we could have plants, and some of them we can have humans and, and different ideas. This, for example, is a, a, what was trying, we call it like a flying garden. The plants which are up there are called uh, Tilansia. They are from uh, Bromelacea family, and they are truly air plants. They do not uh, need soil to survive. They just catch the moisture from the air, and that's enough for them to live. This means this type of uh, uh, Tilansia plant might be a good candidate because they are very light and they do not need uh, soil to survive. There are some of them, we put them inside also, and we start to think a little bit on the idea of a biosphere. So as, as, as you know, biosphere one is the Earth, biosphere two is the experiment in Arizona where they tried to create five different biomes and put humans inside as well to think how uh, could we recreate another Earth somewhere else. Um, but uh, there is actually inherent value in closed system or closed biosphere research. So we were speculating in the studio what could be one of the maybe interiors or purposes of floating structures. Um, there's a value in uh, putting ecosystems and letting atmospheres form on their own and research that can be done to understand how uh, these systems really work without kind of throwing humans in immediately. And um, that, uh, that's why Biosphere 2 failed, of course. So we, were thought, we thought, what about Biosphere 3? Floating yes. greenhouses. Yes. Uh, well, the other thing is like, a, you know, then you start to look and, it's, and then, you know, it's like, a, who might be the inhabitant there? And then, you know, we just get cross about the idea that 20 25 million insects floating in the air at any given time. This means it's a, a pretty crowded somehow also, the, the field there. This means uh, it's not only like, a, you know, it's like look a little bit uh, who, who is already uh, being there. And there is a distinction between uh, bacteria or, or, you know, I, I'm kind of, a, there is something with the ballooning spider which might be interesting to understand if they really kind of uh, choose the path because they're blind or they, they kind of just uh, move by the wind. And the other thing which we speculate, you know, every time that you see a cloud up there, a normal cum uh, cumulus cloud, it might have the weight of 80 elephants. This is the weight of a uh, of a cloud, this means sometimes people think, oh, it might be very heavy what you put up there, but clouds are very heavy <laughs> in some relation and very big. And this means when we come back to this idea of uh, how we can be up there, uh, this means just a little bit what we thought to make a kind of an exercise. Let's say that I want to fly tomorrow morning in front of Potsdamer Platz. I'm 90 kilos 
and I will ask, and then we, and, and it's tomorrow, this means we have a very limited time, and we have 300 euro, this means if each of us we put one euro, we might be able to connect enough uh, resources. How we can do it? And that's a little bit of challenge. Is any of you is, uh, is know how we can do it? Yes? 100,000 liters of helium. No, without helium, only truly with the power of the sun. Oh. If sun is tomorrow outside here, that's a big thing. No hydrogen, no batteries, no nothing. And you have only 300 euro because helium it costs one cubic meter of helium, it costs much more. Then you have 300 euro and you have to fly tomorrow morning if sunny, huh? Wonderful, mm. wonderful. To 10 degrees warmer gives you 0.3% buoyant. Wonderful. Does it mean? Uh, You're on the can, same page, We can follow it, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. But one thing that we all the time forgot, and, and also myself, and a little bit of rehearsing, is like, a, uh, you know, we are so used to say, well, well, then we want to fly, but it's only if it's sunny. No? That's a very important question. And this is something which we don't, uh, we are not used uh, somehow. Um, and it's kind of crucial for the public. This means you can download in the internet together with other passionate people, just for you to give you an idea, this kind of uh, solar balloon could, can lift a man into the air, in this case is myself flying in Argentina. Uh, there have been only eight in the world. This means it's like the community is very, 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 very small. This is the upper part, this is just like a black polyethylene, 50 micron. This means every time that you throw away a garbage bag, you could think uh, that you can tape it together and get up into the air. Uh, now, when we were looking again at the other images, and then, you know, it could, could like a crazy how you can lift it up and here and there. Now, when you keep scaling, and if there is some good in mathematics, better than me, and you know that the volume in relationship to the surface is to the thousand in relationship. When you grow to something which is 1.6 kilometer diameter, uh, and you calculate uh, how much is the rigid structure in this case, we don't do it uh, inflatable, but uh, we might be able to lift up 600,000 kilograms or 7,000 people. Uh, that's the lift of one of these uh, sphere of clusters. Uh, if you make a little bit of the calculation, it might be possible or we can uh, work out together later how it could work. This I mean, once again, is only something which go up with the sun. Now, when it goes so big, uh, and, and you were right, you said before uh, it fly with 10 degree of difference between inside and outside, it's always in relation with the volume. That's the balloon that we built before is 24 meter, let's say, diameter. We were flying with 60 degree of the difference of temperature between inside and outside. When you go up to 1.6, with one degree of temp difference of temperature between inside and outside, you can already fly with one degree. Does it mean, this is a little bit where Sasha is trying to say, you know, this kind of uh, connecting a little bit back. Uh, does it mean just only like people breathing inside uh, the sphere, it might be able to be elevated up into the air or to have some plants uh, transpirating. Does it mean, and then the other is like usually you have a valve that you can open and close and then this, for this you can choose the altitude. And then, well, we can go back a little bit on the idea of, of also, also how we have inhabited the planet Earth and how transportation has been a kind of a, a source of distribution. Or, you know, I mean, for example, the, the British, when they arrived to South America in Buenos Aires, you have all the railways, right? And all the cities, they were around the railways. Now the railways stop and then the cities are dying somehow. So this means the way of how we access and how we have been moving around the planet. And you go back a little bit maybe of the idea of Lewis Mumford when he thinks like a, the origin of the city was the necropolis. And it's got a little bit also to forget about the technology. They said that, you know, humans before on the planet and majority of time we have been hunters and gatherers. This means we have been moving all the time around and <coughs> catching the prey and, uh, and uh, catching the fruits which naturally were there. Now, uh, somehow, then, uh, one of the rituals that we were performing, uh, Manfred said, is like, well, when somebody died, then you make a, some of the culture may make a, a, a hole in the ground, and then you bury the people that you love. Then you put some stone on the top, and then you want to come back somehow, right? I mean, this means the origin of the city is the necropolis, what he argued. This means, uh, is this kind of, you know, through this kind of nomadic uh, circulation of people, do you always want to come back because you want to be close to the people who you love because they are there still somehow. Now this kind of a love affair that you have with this person is what then maybe may make then later um, invent agriculture because then you want to be close, then you get invented agriculture. And then you get invented other technology, but somehow the first wish is something which is, 
you know, it's not like an elevator allows you to make skyscraper or agriculture allows you to stay in a place. It's a little bit like think uh, uh, in another way. Uh, we, we hope so, that we can speculate on that. And this has been uh, also when was at Tate and with Steve and the other one we have been talking with, Brian Hosking, and then we start to speculate what it will be to have natural highways. This has been one of the things also of climate engineering is a lot about um, moving around. The yeah, planet. so we, you know, um, uh, I think uh, Steve said, said, said something recently um, in the talk yesterday, which was that um, we don't have a technology unless you have the social construction or the social relations. Um, so if we, if we change our behavior towards being more attuned to the sun and to the air and to living in floating structures, maybe we would know more about aerial currents and stratospheric winds and convection, and we could use highways in the air more efficiently. Yes. Yeah. Well, anyway, like 30% what we understood is account for all the p pollution which today is in there is through transportation. Uh, well, then it come, maybe Sasha, if you want to Yeah, talk, so what's really exciting is um, uh, Tomas obviously has done a lot of research on solar balloons, but recently he's begun a residency with CNES, which is the French Space Agency. Um, and they are really uh, kind of the, the pioneers or the, or the masters in solar balloon technology. Since the 1970s, they've been flying their Montgolfier infrared balloons, which are balloons that uh, uh, capture the sun's radiation during the day to, to lift. And then during the night, they absorb infrared radiation from the Earth's surface to stay aloft. So it's really important to know that they, it's a balloon that can fly during the day and the night. Um, and it's really useful for taking scientific samples from the uh, upper troposphere, lower stratosphere, because these balloons can stay in that zone for, I think, 71 days was the record in 2004. Yeah. Just to give you an idea, when we build, I mean, this is 80 meters high, and also they, they ch change all the time. Basically, it's a balloon which is designed to fly during the night. I mean, when I fly with my black balloon, uh, homemade with a tape and polyethylene, when it comes a cloud in front, then I calm down, right? <laughs> <laughs> Unless I'm above the level of the clouds. This means I have to fly a little bit high. This, this balloon fly pretty high. Uh, 18 to 32 kilometers. So it'll get up to 32 kilometers during the day, and then it drops to 18 yes. kilometers at night. Yes. Once again, there is no solar panels. There is no batteries. There is no hydrogen. There is no helium. There is nothing. It's just envelope who can make a difference of temperature between the inside and the outside. And what, I mean, and then I'm always thinking, you know, it's a, it's a balloon which is designed to, you know, it's like I'm, you know, because then the Earth is kind of became the second sun because it's, uh, you know, it irradiates this kind of uh, infrared radiation who allows the balloon to be up into the air only du also during the night at this given size. Now, if we grow up bigger, then we can also just by the breathing. This I mean, is, you know, this was a little bit with Brown also, we start to speculate about the idea, oh, because they ask what will be a monument for the Anthropocene, and then we thought they're like a monument who doesn't have a fixed location, who somehow breathes and then move around uh, the planet Earth. So we've given you a sense of how we, you can use solar radiation to, um, to fly into kinetic energy. And so just to put this in, a, I guess, like a cosmic perspective, there's a scale called the Kardashev scale, which you might know about, at which civilizations are ranked according to how advanced they are in using energy. A type 1 civilization harnesses the energy of its planet, a type 2 its nearest star, and a type 3, three its galaxy. So Carl Sagan said we were about 0.8, I think, um, on the Kardashev scale. But the idea is that the more advanced we get, the better we are at using the energy from the nearest star, the sun. So in a way, I know um, there are reasons for kind of putting aerosols in, this, in, the, in the atmosphere to block the sun. But wouldn't it, uh, doesn't that seem a little bit uh, silly when we could actually use that energy? What if we could just use it directly, I guess, is what we're trying to say, and, mm. and more mm. efficiently? Mm. And then, um, yeah, you might know. I mean, we were just speculating. It might be uh, interesting of trying to see, OK, these fears. Then it's like, a, I mean, I'm trying to get into all this <laughs> engineering. If it's like a kind of a completely mirror what it happened, how many you might have. But at the same time, you know, what, what Brown also the other day said, oh, Thomas, instead of being spraying aerosol, he's spraying up people <laughs> in the air, right? <laughs> or plants or something else. And I mean, it's a little bit also to take responsibility of what you put up there, right? If you spray yourself up there, and I will volunteer, you know, somehow you can, I think so, you know, and, and we are dust particles at the end of the day. This I mean, is a little bit to acknowledge this uh, kind of a, a, a force relationship uh, that we, we try to um, uh, engage with, with, uh, 
with the planet and with the, the energy of the sun. Well, you know, but Mr. Führer is a, is a great master and he was all one of the one who speculated with the project of Cloud9 and, and all these kind of things. I mean, we go back to some of the images. And then the other one, well, about this albedo, the reflectivity of the things, we thought like maybe to, it's nice to start to see some of the images and also uh, remember that as clouds are, no, they always can, uh, and, and, and in this case, each of these spheres are, uh, are uh, uh, or biospheres or whatever, but somehow they might also uh, contain reflective surfaces because if you have a, a huge sphere, of, then you might need in some moment also to get the sun down there. This I mean is a little bit about the, the porosity of how these uh, clouds might be able to reflect the sun, and this is a little bit of experiments of how the sun it might circulate in the interior of the cloud. This is kind of another sample that we put some yes in this case solar panel. Uh, to get the energy to uh, follow up the GPS tracking and know where the balloon end up. Uh, this again, so more. in this case we are cooking a chicken <laughs> in the <laughs> middle of a flying solar balloon. This was during Atelier Calder and we might need some food also up there. <laughs> and, um, so uh, one thing which I think really differentiates Tomas's projects or his, his ideas from climate engineering proposals is that m uh, myself when I'm reading these climate engineering articles, often I feel like there's not very much agency given to individual people. Um, it seems like these proposals might be undertaken by a small group of people on a very large scale. Um, Tomas's artworks, on the other hand, they, the vision is quite big. The, I, the idea of a cloud city is, is quite a visionary idea, but actually his artworks, they start in the here and now. They start from different people coming together collectively to do actions together, and that should have been a video of um, one of Tomas's recent artworks on space-time foam, in which, um, on a membranous surface, uh, there were about uh, five or ten people, and you were um, interacting with each other and with uh, the surface and with the air itself, of course. And it sounds very simple, but actually, you got this immense sense of having like a like a cause and effect in the way your actions were affecting other people's actions, and had the, uh, and were also affected by others. So um, there's a sense in which there's a kind of uh, solidarity that's created in his artworks, um, in which we have a real kind of sense of agency. Um, and um, I think uh, that's uh, pretty beautiful. Um, yeah, sorry, the video, it, 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 it never put video. The first time I put video, it, it doesn't work. But uh, nevertheless, it's something that, uh, um, um, what, what Sasha was saying, you know, is like a, a, now a little bit looking inside. You know, usually balloon, they're always uh, uh, they have a kind of a membrane. Okay, just leave it there and make it bigger. We forgot about the video. Yeah, wonderful. And this, I mean, this is a space also with this relationship with the air. You know, it's like every people who kind of breathe down there, it might affect also the way how people. Uh, Leave up there. This means a space, you know, if I will be, let me put it that way, people usually, the first thing that they say then, also, when we have a conference with Bruno Latour, uh, in, uh, he came up and then we were walking together there, the first analogy that people does is like, oh, it's like a jumping castle, right? But you cannot jump here. Let me put it that way. The volume of the air is very, very big. And this, I mean, even when you experience that, then you have this kind of memory. It's like a, when you are in a, in a hot air balloon, I don't know if so, how many of, of you have been flying, but when you, you know, the always problem of, of all these structures is like a, the relationship with Earth is taking off and landing. But when you are flying with a hot air balloon, it's never windy. You know, I can be talking with Sasha this distance in a gondola, flying in a balloon at very high speed. You know, let's say we are in a jet stream, but it's a bit too high. Let's say we fly 10 meters above the ground, and we'll be talking in this. The head of Sasha doesn't move. Now, now I look down to the Earth, like three meters down, and there is a tree shaking like crazy. Now I look at her head, and, and you know, your brain cannot reconcile this idea. You know, when you are up there, you move with the wind, right? There is no wind up there. This means if you have a house, you don't need windows, maybe, because there will be never getting windy. This means it's all the time, you have, I mean, what, what I like about this solar balloon at the end, you know, is like it ties you down very closely uh, to the environment, to a very an extreme, you know what I mean? It's very, 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 very strong. You know, remember a bang, you know, and then I think so, the way then how I build architecture is very different to some thing. In this way also it's the same. No, there is a space which is not really space, it's kind of, kind of, kind of the theory of relativity Einstein. When you enter into the space, you open the space because it's the mass of your body who kind of bends space and time. And when many people are in the same place, 
somehow everybody is kind of a social black hole that people start to fall <laughs> all on the same situation and it's very difficult to escape from it. This means you always is kind of this proxemia, no relationship among people. This means you can get close to somebody but not so close because you get so close then the space uh, it collapses somehow. And at the same time for the approval you can imagine it was very complicated. You know, it's a kind of the big, it's a kind of a lasagna, no, and you are a meatball in between the lasagna. This means uh, um, yeah, it, it kind of uh, I don't know what I like to. To think is a little bit like a, is a very codependent space, right? If I move, you move. It's kind of extended idea of butterfly effect. You know, there is something which somehow um, it drives this uh, this solidarity among people, and 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 then, and not only among people, but also with the space. Because remember, this is a is a pressure space. This means it's pure air who maintain people up there. There is nothing else than air at a certain pressure. This means sometimes people forget the door. Let me see. Uh, the, the door open and then the space collapses very, very quickly. This means you can see in this, uh, close the door, because then the things can go up again. Well. So there's a, there's a sense in Tomas's work um, that it, it really does sensitize you to, um, you, you could say, solar forcing, to borrow a word from climate science. Um, and so there's one project called Museo Aero Solar where people come together, and Tomas was one of the participants originally, but you come together, you donate plastic bags, and people spend a day or so kind of taping them together, connecting them, folding, seaming, making a surface which is then inflated um, into, uh, as a solar balloon is inflated by the sun. And, um, and, and the process really brings many people together to create something which in the end is quite big. Yeah, here we is in, in well, it, what, what I like about the project is uh, still alive. I mean, it was a kind of a very uh, simple idea. Uh, at the beginning, it was in Isolar Center, a, a, a community group of very active. They were turning down the building. This is the last project, I, I promise. <laughs> then uh, somehow they say, well, let's do something together. No? And then I say, well, you know, I'm up, they, they knew that I like balloons and flying and stuff like that. And they say, well, why we don't collect plastic bags? Was there the resources somehow? And then, you know, it, it's happened somehow in simultaneous. This is in Medellin, this is the Emirates Arab, this is again in Medellin, we start to tape together, this is in Hood, got a little bit uh, political dimension uh, in this case, and then when it fly up in the air, then people can enter also, and then again when And it I think this, this image really embodies what we were trying to say through our, enti our entire talk, um, which is also I think what people like Braun and uh, Holly Jean Buck have also alluded to, which is that climate engineering doesn't have to be the intervention of a small group of people from a certain group of countries on a global scale. It can be many people from many different backgrounds coming together, small actions, collective actions, changing their habitats with an eye for beauty. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>question we will try to answer. Yeah, we'll take maybe one round of questions. We're running a bit late, uh, but if I can just maybe collect three questions and then pass them on to you. Yeah, is that okay? Are there any questions? Would anybody like to raise a question? Yes, please. One, two. Do we have a third one? We'll go for two for now. Stephen Salter, uh, Edinburgh University. I was asked recently to find a way to cool Singapore. They wanted to make the temperature of Singapore much more comfortable. And I was working on uh, mylar uh, things to make a sort of airplane wing like this. And I did find that the wind loading, even though Singapore is not in the way of typhoons, was a bit of a problem. And I've got some ideas I can bounce off you about how to solve it. But that was the hardest thing. But I can really believe your hot air. I think that really quite sound. Uh, you may find it's a little bit difficult through the night, uh, but you can certainly do it quite easily during the day. Uh, I think it's great. Uh, no, yeah, but, well, I mean, I'm always said, like, depend of the, the scale. Ah, I have to answer later. Oh, sorry. Yeah, if we can uh, take one more question. And get back yes, to yes. Thank you. Uh, my name is Pablo Suarez from the Red Cross Red Crescent Climate Center. Uh, big, big gratitude. This is so refreshing, so you made us laugh a lot, and for very good reasons. Uh, you and folks like you who come from the arts are very capable of expanding the form, the shape of what we think as possible. Uh, 
is there anything you think we can do to help more folks like you to help us rethink how we talk to each other? We tend to have, you know, we mentioned multidisciplinary, transdisciplinary, undisciplinary, because we're so successful occasionally having a conversation between a physical scientist and a social scientist. I really think we need a lot more art thinkers who change everything about how we think, but I don't think we know how. Any advice? Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, I don't know what to say, but it's, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, thank you. I don't know also, you know what I mean? But uh, uh, what do we say? No, in regard for the, the first question, uh, it is to fly during the day and the night. Let's look together at least something which already exists is here. Is, is the Mir balloon, the Mongol flying red balloon. And these have been, I mean, the normal campaign mission, and they stopped to fly because it's a problem of, of uh, law. I mean, this is something which I want to make clear also. You know, it's like a, when we think about, uh, you know, I'm pretty much in favor of lighter than air technology, and when it gets solar, then it's fantastic. I mean, uh, think also that Zeppelin. Does it mean, uh, uh, you know what I mean? There are many people who kind of conflict because you say, well, when you got up there, you might conflict with the aeroplane. But so no, uh, somehow you have to, we have to, uh, you know, also on the governance and law and all of this embrace this. But, uh, but this uh, solar balloon of, of Mir, it flies during the night. Huh? Just let's, let's put it that way. We, we have to look, and they have been out, I don't know how many campaigns, I think so 80. And they, now they stopped to fly because the earth it became too much populated and they have conflict with law, they don't let them fly anymore. This yes. I mean, it's something which, you know, the only balloon who can be up in the air, polyethylene, eh, is half mirror on the top, transparent, is top flying now 2018. They are uh, hoping they will change the law and be able to fly again. Yeah, so basically the international aerial law changed so that um, it, it's no longer like um, the balloon is not secure enough to fly. And they're actually working on a, a, a new balloon that will be secure enough to meet the international uh, aviation law that will be launched by 2018. But to the question on interdisciplinarity, it's a really tough question because there is ha there has been kind of a rise in frameworks to promote art science collaboration, especially in the UK, for example, which is where I'm normally based. Um, but uh, there's many problems with um, that word because often it can mean um, an artist and a scientist, and I've seen this happen, have one conversation, the artists make an artwork, and that really there, there has really not been no collaboration or kind of cross-learning. And I think the, um, the, the best kind of model is when an artist and a scientist spend a lot of time together. So when it's kind of a long-term residency, people go, the artist is in the lab or the scientist is in, is in the studio. That really works best. And what happens, what is produced, is something that is not art or science, but something actually very new. Uh, it's not art science. It's different than that. Um, so I guess that would be yeah. how I would answer your question. It's not really an yeah. answer to your question, but yeah. thanks. No, but at the same time, it would be great to, I, I don't know, if anybody um, want to help me or help us to run some models or whatever you have these computers and you know like I mean just to free a little bit to speculate why not I mean we can do it I mean this is why we and, and we the other thing to invitation is very simple I mean it's like it, sometimes it, it take nothing I mean it, it's Bron uh, you know Bronislav said oh Thomas why you don't come to the conference and say climate engineer oh my god you know what I mean <laughs> I didn't thought about uh, much uh, in the sense of climate engineer because you know the um, you know what I mean, but uh, is, uh, sometimes we tend to make it complicated. Is well, I think so. There is an opening later. We can have drinks and, and start to talk about. Is uh, did, did, did anyone teach you yet how to do really simple calculations? I mean, the kinds of calculations that you that you need here for temperature, that you need, and the size and so on. Those are back of the envelope. You can do it in the, you yes. can, somebody can teach you that. Did anybody teach you that? That's the kind of exchange that you're talking about. I'm wondering. Uh, no, I mean, I, I mean, yeah, it, but that's the beauty about solar balloons. That's, that, that's the thing, because everybody, you know, we, we don't want to get into this kind of, uh, you know, easy. I'm, yeah, Sasha said, oh, don't talk it about anti-technology, you know what I mean? But it's a technology which exists there, f I mean, not so many years, at, at, at the same the scale that a human can be up into the air. I mean, solar balloons have been uh, a little bit, but, uh, but not so much. I mean, and the calculation is very simple. I can do it, because it's just like a difference of temperature between inside and outside. Now, when we start to speculate a little bit more, like, okay, okay if it's a pure mirror, and we start to make a, a, a cloud of this. I mean, I just was so interesting to start to speculate with you. It's like, a, okay, we'll reflect the sun, we'll absorb how much is, what is inside depend also, you know, we'll, uh, uh, you know, absorb more than what will reflect and so forth. It's just only to try to get it to the scale of, of something. But at the same time, you know, it does something, but it changes the way of 
thinking, living, your experience. You know what I mean? It's something which does not get so maybe direct to the, to the thing. Okay. All right. Well, we certainly have a chance to carry on this conversation now during the poster session that we're going to have next. And uh, with that, I think certainly it was a perfect match for you to come here. I think it was very enriching for us. And I'd like to thank you again for this very interesting and a very refreshing presentation that you gave. Thank you.